Uh, my name is Abdullahi. That's a full Abdullahi Ahmed Al Naim. Uh, but I go by Abdu, A B D U H, uh, because that is a short form that is valid linguistically in the Arabic script and is the one that my family uses, including my children and grandchildren now. Uh, so it is Abdullahi, Ahmed Al Naim, or Abdu. Uh, I, I, I was born 1946 in Sudan uh, and studied all you know, sc school. I went to the University of Khartoum where I graduated in law. Um, and my interest has always been about what I call public law, uh, constitutional, criminal, uh, criminology, and so on. Um, and I remember that um, particular influence that I had in early life is that the, the professor who taught me constitutional law was an American. He was a fresh graduate or recent graduate of Yale Law School who came to Sudan as uh, the local representative of the Ford Foundation. And uh, being short on faculty, the law school invited him to teach, so he taught us the full course. Um, of American constitutional law, including a case book and everything. So I was really excited and, and inspired by, by, by that. Um, and so I finished law school and then I was recruited by the law school to come to for training in Britain and go back to Sudan to teach. Because the, the University of Khartoum was in the post-independence period looking to indigenize its faculty. So, uh, so when I, when I went to Britain, I went to Cambridge for two years and to Edinburgh for three years. The two years I attended at Cambridge was in public, public law. That's, I had the LLB in public law, which was a degree, a postgraduate degree in Cambridge. And then I, went, I did criminology also. When I went to Edinburgh, I did criminal law uh, slash criminal justice in comparative terms, uh, comparing American, uh, Scottish, and English law. Um, it was specifically on the pre-trial criminal procedure. So it was the most constitutionally loaded aspect of the criminal process. And I was always ad admired uh, tremendously the jurisprudence of the American Supreme Court in the 30s, 40s, 40s, 50s, 60s, in building uh, this wealth and, and, and reverence. I mean, it is really, it's difficult to see it now, but at the time, um, many people like myself who are fresh graduates and uh, African or Muslims, I am an African Muslim, so both aspects apply to me. How inspired we were, how uh, uh, totally uh, engrossed in, in, the, in the power of jurisprudence and justice is, is explaining and, and elaborating on the constitution and some level of invention of constitution and doctrine about privacy, for example, and so on. Uh, so when I finished my PhD, I went back to teach in Sudan. And in Sudan, I was part of a, 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 a religious movement called uh, that we were named just after the, the teacher that we followed. His name was Mahmoud Muhammad Taha. And he was a teacher in the sense of a grand master of, of jurisprudence and Sufi doctrine and so on, and, and discipline. Uh, uh, and he was also very liberal, and therefore he reinforced uh, my, my commitment to this uh, doctrine of, of public law and and, and accountability and transparency and all of these ideas. Because I, I lived in the United States quite a bit of time. I mean, the first time I came to the US was 1981. I had a fellowship at Columbia Law School in human rights. I came for a year with my wife and kids, and we went back home to Sudan. Then um, when I went back uh, two, three years later, I was arrested with other group members of, members of our group. Um, because we opposed the application of Sharia by the state, and because we opposed the continuation of the civil war in the South. 
Um, so so I, I spent about 18 months in prison. And when I was released with the rest of the group, I came out of Sudan to come to Columbia Law School, where, or rather Columbia University, because that's where I had my fellowship. And I had contacts and friends. And from there, I went to UCLA, where I taught for two years uh, as a visiting professor. And, and that's where I taught human rights, international law, and the same subjects that I'm teaching at Emory for a very long time. That was in the mid 80s. Uh, then there was a time when I left, I went to Canada, I went to Sweden. I was exiled, but no, I did not seek asylum. Uh, so unfortunately, because I kept getting academic appointments, uh, I was able to, to, you know, go to Canada, go to Sweden, go to Egypt, uh, Cairo, um, waiting for things to improve in Sudan that I can go back and resume my life as teaching at the University of Khartoum. But it never did. I mean, things went to worse and worse. The Islamists took over the state by a military coup, military coup in 1989. And things um, really went into tremendous collapse of all our institutions, education, judicial, uh, diplomatic, everything. Was, was was collapsing. <clears throat> so that's, then I came back to the US uh, in 1992 uh, to work in Human Rights Watch. I was the director of Human Rights Watch Africa. And the question of institution and what, what does it mean to have institutions like the Supreme Court? What does it take to have them? And what does it take to keep them? Because I think that also one of the lessons I learned in my life, because I had various types of problems, and including political detention and in Sudan and having to leave Sudan by the mid 80s for political reasons and staying away and teaching in various places. So to me, but the, the, the feeling and my own scholarship about African constitutionalism and about Islamic constitutionalism, what makes it Islamic, what makes it African, and what makes it constitutionalism. Um, and, and to me, it was very clear early on, but reinforced over time, that these doctrines and institutions and, and, and very, very smooth uh, playing out of constitutional principles and so on, takes tremendous effort in uh, in Arabic, we say terbia, meaning discipline, uh, and um, raising up someone in the values mm -hmm. of why constitutionalism, why democracy. And uh, I remember over time, I always was suspicious of the tendency of American scholars, American intellectuals, and American public figures to take it for granted that we are um, so great and wonderful a country because we are American. It, it is a reversal that um, this is a good country or a great country because of the values that it lives. Not that the values are not uh, uh, critical to its own, uh, what I call uh, health and, and, and survival. Mm -hmm. So um, I always believe, and my work in human rights in particular, is emphasizing that uh, human rights are not just simply treaties that you adopt and implement um, by the state. Uh, in fact, that's a failure of human rights. For me, human rights have to be the values that people live by. Uh, if they are not there, then they are not anywhere. Um, I, and this is what I am writing about now and so on. So um, in my work, I did a couple of works on, on African constitutionalism. And a book that really carries my commitment and values that I speak of here was published in 19, uh, 2006. It's called African Constitutionalism and the Role of Islam. So it combines both my concern with Islam and constitutionalism and African, post colonial Africa and constitutionalism. So the, 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 those are the values that I live by constantly. And, 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 and that's what keeps me going. I mean, I can't imagine a world in which these values are not upheld. Um, it, it is not something that is worthwhile 
or, or, or honors my humanity and the humanity of all other people uh, and so on. So that's what I'm, I'm beginning to worry about and miss in the current environment. I, I worry when I feel that there is um, a, a autopilot sort of attitude. I mean, like when you when you're flying, you you take off. You know, if you are, take the metaphor of an airplane, it's you know one of those huge, uh, highly complex, and so on. And you take off, and then you get the first ten fifteen minutes when the um, the, the the staff or or and the technical leadership and the captain and others are taking over and, and, uh, and making everything work properly. And then there is a point when they will stop doing that uh, and it will be on autopilot, um, we are told. And then how um, that continues, I mean, unless there's something problematic and so on. So the idea of autopilot is what worries me about what's going on here. That there is no autopilot to the, the doctrine of constitutionalism and human rights and uh, democracy internationally. These are arts and sciences to be mastered and practiced by people. It is never to be trusted to some sort of uh, entity that is independent of human judgment and responsibility. And that is what, what fascinated me. And uh, my own country, Sudan, uh, we became independent in 1956. So we were the first sub-Saharan African country to become independent. But we were uh, somewhat odd also because it was a condominium that Sudan was ruled or by Egypt and Britain. Um, so the, the, I think that we are the only country probably in the colonial Annals of history that that had that quote unquote distinction. Uh, so, because of the two uh, co sort of condominium countries uh, competing, Egypt and Britain, um, Sudanese got a break, um, probably more than others. Who we started earlier, and we we looked like we were going to be on track. Um, but the, the idea was that. Uh, these values are not really in those terms in our fundamental African Islamic cultures. That there are resources within our cultures that can be translated into this, that can sustain uh, these notions of, of the values of constitutionalism, the values of human rights, which is all about how we deal with other people. Uh, how we respect their entitlements, how we honor their dignity, human dignity, how we make sure that there is social justice in our societies, that people are not really driven into dehumanizing poverty and, and, and degradation and, and so on. Uh, but so I think my life has been a discovery of, of the truth of what I saw or what I was taught from the beginning, which is that these are values that you live by, not values that you can entrust a, a, a faceless bureaucratic institution to take care of it. Yes, I, I think that the, uh, the point is that um, it is all in human beings um, and what they do or fail to do. Uh, because I believe that nothing happens unless a human person does something or fails to do something. Of course, I mean, in, in you know, earthquake can take place, tsunamis can happen, but in terms of daily political governance and self-governance and democratic uh, administration, uh, protection of the rights of individual persons and so on, all of that is entirely human. That, of course, I, I'm a Muslim, and I believe that God sent the Prophet Muhammad to teach us and to help us understand and live these values. But ultimately, when it comes to really what happens and how it happens, it is human beings who do also to do. And I, I worry when I see that people are tending to assume that we don't have to do this, that it will take care of itself. 
That's what I mean by autopilot and how deadly it is. Deadly, I say, not only uh, just serious. Because a democracy or a, a political entity which does not live by these values and pretend just simply to use them almost like uh, uh, a degree of um, hypocrisy and dishonesty that we, we because I mean the, the biggest fault I think in character that I am aware of, I mean the idea that you, you do something and say something else. When you pretend that you, you adhere to these values but in practice, you don't. When that happens, that society is heading down, down the drain of history. It cannot really sustain its uh, vision and its strength, its justice to its own people and to people, other people it deals with, uh, so long as you have this hypocrisy. Um, and, and in my work in human rights, I recently, hopefully, finished a book that it may come out soon, I call it decolonizing human rights. And the idea of the book is that human rights are not treaties, are not international documents that are negotiated by states and state delegates uh, in close corridors of power. Human rights are what our children um, are raised with and how we treat the next person. Um, it is, it is in how I work with my wife, how I treat my children, how I treat my neighbors. That's where it is. If it is not there, then it's not, not anywhere else. One of the issues that really I struggled with from the very beginning of my academic career in the early 80s is the question of uh, where human rights come from, what are they? And especially the notion of universality that if we believe human, believe human rights to be universal, what, um, what makes them so? How do they get to be? And what are they that get to be this, uh, acquired this quality? And uh, so the discourse was going very much along these lines in, among all people who are concerned with human rights. And the assumption was that liberal values equal human rights. Uh, and that liberals know what human rights are by virtue of their own ideology and philosophy and upbringing. But the rest of the world has to learn how to become a part of the human rights uh, communities. Uh, and that um, all non-Western, non-liberal uh, value systems and practice were deemed to be relativist and therefore non-universal because we subscribe to religious or subscribe to cultural values that are not universal. Uh, therefore, we have to learn how to shed uh, these uh, constraints of our human rights commitment and come and join the liberal glorious uh, past. Uh, and I oppose that. And I said, no, I mean, human rights have to be universal to everybody on their own terms, or else it is not human rights. The fact that uh, there is no unanimity that is in the, inherent in the nature of, of human beings and what they do. There is a very powerful uh, statement by Albi Sachs, South African Constitutional Justice, who was part of the struggle for, again, as apartheid, and became one of the justices of the um, South African Constitutional Court. He, he said that, Human rights are, are about the right to be the same and the right to be different. But that we tend to, whatever we believe human rights to be, we want to be treated on the same basis of that conviction. But also that includes our right to be different. Mm -hmm. That we cannot be required to be the same in every way that we lose our identity, our culture, our history, and so on. So in, in, in this recent book, I am now talking about, I call it, uh, it's now with a publisher, and hopefully it will come out soon, I call it decolonizing human rights. My claim is that the concept of human rights has been colonized by Western powers, and which assume the, the right to dictate to everybody else which is almost like um, 
a continuation of the colonial policy of so-called civilizing mission, that uh, the rest of humanity will become civilized by European and North American, the United States included, who will tell them what to do and how to do it. And, and so I oppose all of that. And I say that, well, I mean, for me, it is not human rights until it is mine by my conviction, by my uh, belief in, 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 in commitment to it. Um, so the, the, the idea of the struggle to, to do this um, in a way that uh, people can believe in, so that it is not something that you enforce. It is something that you live by, 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 by conviction and choice, and so on. So the, 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 all of that is now sort of coming together in, in this current environment uh, and uh, worrying about that what happens when um, a country like the United States, which is such a massive, powerful, energetic, uh, creative environment, which has sustained itself and helped others to sustain certain values for a long time. What happens when, when that society or, uh, and that culture fail to live up to its own convictions, fail to live up to its own values? Because I'm absolutely convinced that if whoever it is, I mean, there, nothing is human, uh, nothing human is perfect. Um, what human beings do and, and try to do is always lacking or tentative, contingent, uh, uh, sort of in, in ways that could in its own collapse. Um, so that if, if, if that is the case, then nobody is too big to fail, but you don't prop up institutions or economic or otherwise, uh, when, when they are no longer living by their own values and they are no longer to be trusted. Uh, to implement the values of public uh, good uh, for society. So whether it is a country or um, in a situ sort of uh, corporations or classes and institutions of free education, anything uh, is not sort of immune to failure and is no longer sustainable once it fails. This can apply to the United States. I mean, people find it utterly inconceivable that, but there will be a time, and of this I'm convinced that when there will be a time that there will be people living in them in, in what we now call the United States, and they will be and they will prosper and they will live a good life, but it will no longer be the United States. That the United States, like every human civilization or every human initiative, will come to an end. And its end comes through its own failure to live up to its own values. That's my conviction. Well, then, uh, uh, what I try to do since I'm here, uh, I try to contribute to keeping this conviction and practice going. The thing is that, yes, we, we, we will collapse if we don't abide by our values, but we can always recover also if we come to abide by our values. The idea that these values uh, are sort of self-defining and self-sustaining is also misleading. That it is, uh, what do you mean by democracy? How, how democratic is uh, a democratic process is? how constitutional is a constitutional doctrine is, and, and, and sort of how humane and, and civil uh, that uh, human rights principles are universal to all human beings by virtue of their humanity. So the, the point is that, again, it is the, the worry about assuming that we got it, we have it, we are not going to lose it. We, we practice this for a long time and we are, but it has to be not only sustained, but evolving. And I think if uh, evolution of, of social doctrine and practice is, is critical uh, because to begin with, these values came out of certain histories. And, you know, slavery um, and a very, very brutal uh, sort of uh, um, 
uh, what do you call, uh, sort of uh, capitalist uh, system and, and again civil war um, and war on on society, war on people and, and their lives and so on. So the, the history is, is really very instructive, but you have come a long way and you have improved. But none of these values will remain if it is not kept growing and evolving with the nature of society and how it is transforming as well. And this is what is the current uh, danger. The current danger is to think that we, we are there, we made it. We don't need to worry about any of this. No, you don't feel that, you don't believe that. Uh, if you do, then you are really putting yourself at tremendous risk. Um, so the, the, the question for me is, is therefore, where is this rejuvenation going to come from? Um, I remember uh, when I was working on something uh, a few years back, I came across um, a very powerful idea by, uh, I think it was Jefferson, who wrote a letter to someone in which he said that um, the cause of democracy, and of course he didn't use this language um, um, of democracy, of human, of, of constitutionalism and democracy and freedom is that every generation has to sacrifice for sustaining it and to pay the price for it. Not necessarily meaning by going to war or fighting, but living, in fact, it's harder. You know, it is it's interesting that it's harder to live by something than to kill for it. The, the, the idea that I am democratic and I will kill you to show you that how democratic I am or I'm democratic and I will force you to abide by my understanding of what democracy is, what constitutionalism. All of that is, is, is the wrong way to approach the issue. Uh, therefore, uh, when I say constitutionalism, human rights and democracy, I mean for each of them to keep growing and evolving with social conditions and to respond to whatever the challenge is. Because it's not always the same challenge. I think uh, what needs to happen is, or, or to be done, actually. See, I, I fall in, in the trap of my own language. When, when I say what needs to happen, as if it's going to happen by itself. But it, actually, it is what needs to be done. Because it's all the human beings who do, or fail to do. By failing to do, we are enabling something to happen. Well, by doing it, we, we are enabling it to happen too. The, that, the idea that how we can somehow, um, that we have made it, that we are the model. Lack of humility and arrogance. You know, these human uh, uh, failures and clarities and, and their history, I mean, throughout, we study history to know that, to know how, you know, every nation, when it became too arrogant to, to be self-critical, and to, be, to hold itself accountable to its own values, that nation is on the way down. And, and therefore, the, the assumption is that, that the notion that we don't need to do anything. Uh, my, my honest opinion, and all, with all due respect and humility on my part, because I, have, I cannot use sort of an occasion to be critical, to, to, to let sort of hide my own ignorance and, and and um, arrogance, that the idea that uh, law school is about primarily about a tool of, of uh, sort of almost like a, is it a trade skill. Yes. It is not a human value experience. Uh, the more it becomes a trade skill, the more trade it is the, and the tool dimension of it, and the less humane and enlightened and intelligent uh, will the general culture of that society be. So, so the, the, um, when I say uh, it has to come, I mean the, the, that um, those values have to be rejuvenated. Uh, it is every person doing immediately, personally, what it takes to make it so that as soon as I start looking to someone else, somewhere else, to make something happen, 
that is a guarantee that it will not happen. And if it, when it happens, it will not be what I mean it to have to be. That is the, 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 if the question of values, question of, of justice, the question of public service, whatever it is. I have to start with myself. Every time that I have to be, uh, you know, Gandhi has this very powerful expression uh, about, uh, I think it's about uh, being what you want to, what you want, being the change you want to see in the world. Absolutely. If it is not that, then it is not worth having. Uh, and when, when you encounter something like this, so biotic, so beautiful, or uh, like Albi Sachs' expression about freedom, about human rights, are about the right to be the same and the right to be different. When, when these, what I call uh, human uh, prophets of, of truth, prophets of human experience, um, the question therefore is, what can I do to make that happen? It has to be with, starting with myself. It can never start with someone else. 